from. And thank you. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Kaide Kawauchi. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Intentional Endowments Network. I'm joining you from the Seattle area where I grew up, uh, which is occupied land of the Duwamish, Squamish, Muckleshoot, and Snoqualmie tribes. And one of the reasons why we start these sessions with land acknowledgments is to remind us that repairing our relationships with place and people and this planet is um, through investments and capital allocation is at the center of our collective work. And in advancing our collective knowledge and work on equity and justice, uh, today's webinar is actually part of our racial equity investing series. We've hosted a few conversations on this topic in the past year, as you can see. IEM members can go back to access the recordings of these sessions if you miss them. And there are more um, upcoming like the one today to support the learning journey of this community. So stay tuned for more announcements on that. Um, and these workshops or webinar series are intended to be a supplementary resource for the investing in racial equity primer that uh, the network's DI working group developed last year. So in the primer, we outlined the 12 action steps that investors can take to make progress on racial equity. And if you haven't seen this resource yet, you can do that by visiting the link listed on the slide. Um, and if you have thoughts or um, on speakers to engage or topics to dive into for these series, uh, you can contact me through the email there. So with that in mind, we invite you to support yourself and be present in this session by you know, grabbing a beverage, maybe having something to write on and removing distractions and taking a deep breath and be ready to engage. And we also ask that you participate to the fullest of your ability. Uh, the growth of this community really depends on the inclusion of all of your voices and to speak from your direct experience or knowledge instead of generalizing. Also uh, practice deep learning through trust and respect. You know, everyone here has come to the table to learn, to grow and share. So we acknowledge that we may be at different stages of learning and um, agree to treat each other's um, reflections and questions with respect. We all you know, make mistakes and have bad days, but when these occur, let's just challenge and encourage each other to do better and to engage in deep learning. We'll want to gain practice reflecting and speaking thoughtfully on difficult topics and to ask for help. It's okay not to know. So keep in mind that we are all still learning again and are bound to make mistakes when exploring new ideas. So be open to changing your mind and make space for others to do so as well and share the air, please uh, share responsibility for including all voices in the discussion. So if you have a tendency to dominate discussions, please take a step back and help the group invite others to speak. And if you tend to stay quiet, on the other hand, please challenge yourself to share ideas so others can learn from you and to maintain confidentiality. So this session is being recorded as you heard when you join um, this webinar. Uh, but stories that are shared privately should stay in this room unless permission is given by the person sharing the story that it can be uh, shared in another setting. Um, and tips and reminders. So last but not least, please keep in mind to use the chat function to ask for technical help or to introduce yourself as I see some of you are already doing um, and to use the Q&A box to ask uh, questions to the speakers. Please keep yourself muted unless you're asked by the speakers to go off mute to share your thoughts. Um, and again, that this session is being recorded. All right, so today we're very excited to invite Michael, Anurada, Nikolai, and Susan, Susan for this conversation. Uh, they'll be introducing themselves in just a moment, uh, but they'll help us understand why human rights is an essential part of your sustainable investing strategy, how your investments can be connected to adverse impacts on people, and how to act, take action to manage the human rights risks align, to align with your own ESG policies. So our hope is that the framework would be useful in helping this community get a sense of why strategies like this make financial sense and what it might look like in practice. We'll have 10 minutes at the end for a Q&A, so we look forward to hearing your input and reactions to what they have to share. And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Michael. Kaede, thank you so much and a tremendous thanks to everyone who is taking time out of their busy days to participate and to engage with this, this panel discussion on an incredibly important topic. The way the panel discussion is going to work is, first, the four panelists are going to look at the question of why human rights should be an essential component of 
an investor's sustainable investing strategy. And we'll start with Nikolaj, then myself, and then Susan, and then Anurada. And we'll each speak for about five minutes. After that, we will turn to the question of what can investors do to mitigate human rights violations from their investment portfolios? And we'll go through in the same order. I would ask the panelists when they start to just spend a few seconds, as Kaede said, just providing a short introduction of, of who you are. And finally, at the very end, we will have time for, for Q&A. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Nikolaj. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And thanks to Kaida as well and the Intentional Endowments Network for, for hosting and for inviting uh, the PRI to speak. So yeah, just by way of brief introduction, my name is Nikolai Peterson and I lead the PRI, so the Principles for Responsible Investments work uh, specifically on human rights as we're discussing here today. Uh, and I'm also just gonna start um, on the concept of human rights before I dive into why this is uh, an important issue uh, for investors, just for a bit of context uh, for our audience. So the concept of human rights is, of course, an incredibly powerful concept, the idea that uh, certain rights are owed to every individual, irrespective of uh, group, class, characteristic, and so forward, as a means to which to live a life of uh, dignity, uh, dignity and well-being. So I think we have a slide uh, we're just going to bring up where I show a few examples. Um, should be coming up in a second here, yeah. So this is by no means an extensive list. Uh, there are many more human rights, but this is just to give a sense of the breadth of the issues we're talking about when we are discussing human rights. So as you'll see in this picture, there are some that would be falling into the category of civil and political rights. Others are economic, social, or cultural rights. Essentially, these uh, rights can belong to individuals that businesses and investors are um, dealing with in a variety of ways. So for example, the workforce, very importantly, uh, communities where business operate uh, might be affected. It could also be customers or end users of products and services that are uh, impacted uh, by the way business is done. Um, the way in which um, businesses um, interact with, um, with, with people of different stakeholder groups will vary across uh, different sectors and geographies. And so this is another important lens through which uh, both businesses and investors should uh, think about these issues. Then also, uh, very importantly, there are specific groups that are either temporarily or more long term in situations of vulnerability, and there are special um, standards and protection for, for those which investors should pay uh, heightened attention to. And if we can have the next slide. So these international uh, human rights are codified in certain recognized standards. So uh, there is, for example, the International uh, Bill of Human Rights. Um, there is the ILO, the International Labor Organization's core conventions, which uh, form the sort of substance of the human rights framework that um, investors and businesses um, should be concerned with. Now, you might be listening to me now saying, well, wait a minute, human rights isn't that primarily a job for states and that would be exactly right that states are certainly the primary uh, entity uh, which is responsible for protecting human rights but as you can see here in this picture in 2011 the un unanimously endorsed a set of uh, principle called the un guiding principle for business and human rights which clarified that there is there are responsibilities that falls on businesses and investors as well and this followed decades of examples uh, in which uh, through international trade and increased freedoms of uh, multinational enterprises, uh, we started to see more uh, emerging issues on human rights that were basically the direct consequence of the way in which these businesses uh, were conducting themselves. So we are dealt with, we're dealing with a, with a regime here where of course states are ultimately uh, responsible for protecting human rights, but companies and investors will find themselves in situations having to deal with issues uh, that falls within their own responsibility. So let me move on to why uh, human rights are important for investors. Now, there is an increased attention to this uh, generally in society and the investment community will feel this uh, directly from clients. It could be from beneficiaries, for example, pension savers, 
or in the context of uh, university endowments, uh, student movements that have certain preferences uh, and agendas on human rights that they have to uh, deal with. Human rights are also a set of issues that can cause uh, reputational damage to investment institutions uh, if they're not uh, managed properly. So that's an important aspect to consider as well. Now, we also live in a time where there's an incredible amount of uh, disruption uh, and unpredictability, the climate emergency and the just transition. And just to mention a few sectors, this uh, affects extractives, renewable energy, automotives and real estate. And within these sectors, uh, you will see transformations in the way these activities are undertaking and that will impact uh, workforce, um, it will impact communities and ultimately it will also impact customers. Uh, another example would be the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the way in which pharmaceutical companies are now responding with uh, the uh, development and production and distribution of uh, vaccines. Uh, and there's a whole set of human rights issues related to that. So essentially, any individual investor will have a portfolio that are subject to both uh, idiosyncratic risk of individual companies, but also some of these systemic risks that emanate from these transitions and the human rights issues that are related to them. Um, and then uh, another important point I want to make, and if we can move to the next slide, is just that there's a whole set of regulatory and legal risk as well associated with this agenda now. So there is basically an emergence uh, and a sort of um, intensifying in policy and regulation across different jurisdictions. And this puts human rights squarely on the radar of boards and management. Um, and so on top of the, let's say, financial risk that exists independently of these frameworks, this increasingly uh, adds another set of um, potential consequences for businesses that doesn't manage uh, these issues properly. So just to complete my remarks here, even if human rights standards, these international standards that I've mentioned are separate from a lot of the legal uh, frameworks on investor duties and fiduciary duties, there is a convergence here, and particularly with some of these legal developments that we see that this also is a very strongly uh, emerging uh, risk and also opportunity, I should say, that lands on the, on the priority list of investors. No, I, thank you so much. Um, my name is, is Michael Kleinman and I lead Amnesty International USA's work on tech and human rights. And what I'm going to do just for the next few minutes is building on what, what Nicola just said, give a deep dive looking specifically at VCs, illustrating their lack of human rights due diligence, and then show how that impacts investors as well as our economies, politics, and societies in general. So if we could start with the first slide, please. Next slide, please. Terrific. Thank you. So the problem, as a recent report by Amnesty called Risky Business showed, is that venture capitalists today operate with little to no consideration of the broader human rights impacts of their investment decisions. Next slide, please. As Nikolai explained and is set forth in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, companies and investors have a responsibility to respect all human rights, wherever they operate in the world and throughout their operations. What this means is that investors, including VCs, must undertake human rights due diligence. This means they must take proactive and ongoing steps to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for the human rights impacts of their investments. Next slide, please. We, Amnesty, issued a report in late July in which we surveyed 53 of the world's largest VC firms and startup tech accelerators, supplemented by desk research into their publicly available materials. Of the 50 VC firms and three tech accelerators that we surveyed, we found that a single firm potentially had adequate human rights due diligence policies in place. Next slide, please. An additional eight firms, which is 15%, said that they conduct some level of human rights due diligence, though it was not to the level required by the guiding principles. Finally, 44 of the 53 firms and accelerators that we surveyed, which is 
we were not able to find any evidence whatsoever that they conduct any form of human rights due diligence around their investments. In other words, when it comes to human rights and the impact of their investments, they are flying blind. Next slide, please. Just to be super clear, this failure to carry out adequate due diligence is a failure of the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. This is not something that can simply be waved away. Next slide, please. Now, there are three concrete consequences of this failure by VC firms to respect human rights. First, VC firms invest in companies whose products and services have been directly implicated in ongoing human rights abuses. For instance, some of the largest venture capital firms in the world and in the US have invested in Chinese facial recognition and surveillance companies that support the Chinese government's repression of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Second, this almost complete lack of human rights due diligence means that VCs invest in companies whose business models have a proven and significant negative impact on human rights. Some of you might have heard about the business model of surveillance capitalism, which is what powers Facebook and Google, basically the idea that they are incentivized to collect ever more personal information in order to target ads, which has a significant and deleterious, a word I love, impact on the right to privacy, or really fundamental issues around gig economy business models and labor rights. Next slide, please. Now, the third concrete consequence of this lack of VC human rights due diligence is looking forward as VCs support and invest in new, new technologies and new applications of those technologies. And what we're particularly concerned about is the growth of artificial intelligence machine learning tools and their deployment across a wide variety of sectors, health tech, fintech, ed tech, gov tech. And they are concerned when it comes to the willy nilly use of these tools without any human rights due diligence is the potential for these tools to amplify existing societal bias and discrimination, which is called basically the issue of algorithmic bias. So if we start with flawed or biased data, and we don't take the time to try and understand how that's biased, then the output from these seemingly objective tools is itself incredibly biased. And we've seen how this impacts already marginalized communities who are often the victims of this kind of algorithmic discrimination. Next slide, please. Now, I'm almost finished, but I want to highlight one last issue, which ties into this lack of due diligence, which is the really stunning lack of diversity amongst venture capital firms. So women comprise 23% of VC investment staff and 16% of venture capital investment partners. 4% of VC investment staff are Black, and only 3% of VC investment partners are Black. 4% of VC investment staff are Latinx, and people of Latinx um, descent are only 4% of VC investment partners. Now, this lack of diversity has one really significant impact, which, next slide, please, which means that most of the funding that these people provide goes primarily to people who look like me. All female founding teams received just 2.2% of all US-based VC funding. Founding teams that have both a male and female founder received only 15% of VC funding. And Black and Latinx founders received less than 2.3% of all US-based VC funding in 2019. If you look at this from an intersectional perspective, the number is even worse. And this means not only do we have investment teams who represent a really homogenous community and who are not well positioned to think through and understand the impact of the investments they make on marginalized communities, but they're giving money to people who in turn are building tools and services for those same relatively homogenous, relatively well-off communities. So we see this cycle of discrimination repeat itself again and again. So thank you very much. And with that, what I will do is turn it over to Susan. Susan.
Hi, uh, my name is Susan Winterberg. I'm an ESG consultant, um, and I specialize in uh, private markets and particular venture capital. Uh, previously, I was the inaugural fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, Technology and Public Purpose Project, um, where I wrote a paper called Responsible Investing for Tech and Venture Capital, where I outlined sort of what some of those challenges are and what the path forward is uh, for venture capital funds to be able to adopt ESG and human rights. Um, just building on some of Michael's comments, uh, what's happening currently in the VC industry and what are some of the challenges they face. So across the whole industry, it's about 2,700 funds worldwide currently. Only about 10% even mention ESG in any meaningful way. As in, we've started thinking about it, but maybe we don't even have a process yet. So that means over 90% of global assets or global funds aren't even thinking about this. It's not even part of their investment thesis. Uh, so when I started doing this research, I spent a lot of time going through these fun public materials just to see, well, what, what do they believe in if it's not sustainability, ESG, human rights? Um, and one word kept coming up over and over and over again. Almost every single fund had this word, disruption. So their goal is to disrupt. Um, and a lot of like how they think about their role or their ethics as investors has to do with this idea of disruption. So they're there to create a, a new world order. They're there to disrupt big industry. So whether that's uh, you know, big taxi in the case of Uber, big hotel, Airbnb, big higher ed, um, you know, big, big healthcare, big finance. So a lot of what they're trying to do is go in there and create a whole new business model. So a lot of how VC funds sort of uh, look, look for companies they want to invest in is do they have an innovative business model that can completely remake and disrupt and displace an entire industry? So why does human rights due diligence matter if this is sort of your investment thesis? Well, because when you're disrupting something, you're removing jobs. You know, you're impacting the stakeholders, whether it's patients, whether it's you know, children in schools or uh, whatever group it is that you're trying to disrupt. Um, that these groups need to be part of this conversation and the adverse impacts need to be accounted for and mitigated where they are, um, where they're likely to be realized. So the fact that there is no human rights due diligence means that, you know, there can be a great deal of harm and displacement caused to these communities as part of these investment pieces. As we've seen repeatedly over the last decade, um, if we look at what some of the largest and most influential uh, VC funds have been funding. Um, so what are some of the additional challenges that funds face? Well, that VC funds and their startup companies, they have very small teams. So unlike engaging a company like a fully grown company like a Google or Coca-Cola, there's no head of ESG. There is no you know, team of people looking at the supply chain. These are very small, very lean teams, and they don't have that expertise. So even beginning that engagement process can be challenging. When I first started this work two years ago, most funds I spoke to had never even heard the term ESG, so speaking to the largest venture capital fund. So there was a huge learning curve in terms of just bringing them on board with where other asset classes are currently. Um, the second challenge that we're really facing in, in building um, sort of ESG or human rights awareness is that we're going up against sort of an ethos or an ideology inside this industry that's really not compatible with human rights um, or ESG broadly. So a lot of sort of what the belief system is in this industry, in, in the VC industry, is that you have to move as quick as possible. So the classic example of this would be Facebook's motto, former motto, which was move fast and break things. So the, the idea is basically get a product to market as quickly as possible, and then put it into as many hands as possible. So this means, you know, put it out in the marketplace before you fully have thought through all of your policies and safeguards, before you've consulted with stakeholders, just get it out there, you know, let it blow up or whatever it's gonna do, and then you can backtrack and like fix things as you go along. So they're putting products into the marketplace very quickly. Classic example, if you're watching the news this week, Theranos, didn't have a working prototype, didn't matter, launched it anyway, you know, onto patients, onto doctors, and then, you know, quietly behind the scenes, trying to develop the technology, even though it didn't work, sort of the fake it till you make it ethos. Um, and then rapid scaling. So trying to get into every single market as quickly as possible. So if you look at some of these different, you know, sort of the unicorns, the $1 billion plus ventures, uh, try to get into every global market as fast as they could, Airbnb, for example. So, you know, operating a company like that in the United States looks very different than when you start operating in the Middle East where the cultural norms around, you know, where, who is it appropriate to have staying in your home are totally different. Um, as well as, you know, different treatments of different racial groups that may not be the same, you know, country to country. So you do have to have some of these policies in place 
and risk mitigations in place to avoid human rights violations as you scale into internationally, particularly into these high risk contexts. So why does human rights matter for investors? Um, so on, on, on the first level, I guess we talk about investment returns. So, you know, 70% of ventures fail within the first two years and only 1% go on to exit over $1 billion. So part of that problem is they haven't consulted with stakeholders. They don't have a viable business model. They haven't thought through the regulatory processes. I think human rights due diligence could really help them think through what are some of those risks to people and do we have a long-term sustainable business model? Uh, and then the second, which Nikolai sort of talked about is that there was a reputational risk for a lot of these companies, particularly for, um, for institutional investors like yourself who are investing in this area is that when you're going in and disrupting things, whatever that is, there's a high risk of human rights violations, which could ultimately fall back. Uh, and particularly if you're a charitable foundation, you need to think about um, when you're engaging with venture capital, making sure that they're not investing in business models that are sort of antithetical to what you know, your foundation is trying to achieve. So if that's public health, you may need to explicitly call out you know, in your side letters to your, your VC fund managers you know, not to invest in things that harm you know, public health or will harm like racial equity. So sometimes it's like they don't even think about it. So unless you sort of put it into the letter, that would be sort of the first step on how to get uh, how to get them to at least start thinking about this as they're making investments. Terrific. And Susan, that was great. And just to pass it on to the Anurada. Thank you, Michael. And thanks to Kaide for organizing this um, webinar. And thanks to Nicola and Susan. You have said some of the very key points. Um, as I share my presentation, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Anuradha, and I'm the executive director of the Oakland Institute. It's um, an independent policy think tank based in Oakland, California, as the name suggests. Uh, since 2007, when we had the high food price crisis and the financial crisis at the same time, we saw a lot of unusual actors step into the field of investment in agriculture. This included private equity, university endowments, pension funds, uh, moving into investments in farmland, timber plantations, a lot of euphemisms around food security, infrastructure development, impact investment. In 2011, for instance, we found that nearly 56 million hectares of land were either bought or leased by foreign investors. Now that's the size of France and nearly 75% of that was in Africa. As an independent think tank, we wanted to really look into what these investments mean, if they really deliver on the promises of food security, job creation, infrastructure development. What we found was lack of transparency, diligence, and accountability. So I'm gonna share a specific case, which is more recent, not from 2011, though there are many that we, I can share if you go to our website. Uh, which have included investments made by Harvard University, Vanderbilt University, and exposés led to them having to pull out their investments after the students mobilized. But security forces at the PHC plantations uh, for palm oil in Democratic Republic of uh, Congo killed Blaise Makabe and Ifola Fola Nisoni Manu in February of this year. Blaze was accused of stealing fruit that was not found on him or at home, and Ifolofola was accused of stealing plastic chairs. Violence against these community members has continued. Just this September, September 14th, DRC soldiers and PHC guards reportedly destroyed dozens of homes, committed systematic looting in several villages, including torture and kidnapping of civilians from communities who surround the plantations. The security forces specifically targeted local activists who have opposed the company's abuses. On September 15th, Frank Balimbasa, a human rights defender, was arrested. He was kept in jail for weeks without charge. He was finally released, or a provisional release, because his health uh, deteriorated in captivity. Another community member, Jean Bufanda Banga, was arrested and beaten, severely beaten, while in captivity. Local NGOs, community members have called for an international investigation into these grave human rights abuses because the owners of PHC plantations have failed to take any action to address the abuses. So who are these owners? Now the disposition of the communities is mired in colonial history. 
for over a century, the Lokotu, Yali Gimba, and Boteka communities have been forcibly displaced from their ancestral lands. In 1911, the Belgian colonial authorities granted British industrialist Lord Liverholm license to create vast oil palm plantations for his company, PHC. And this was done without the consent of the local communities. The oil palm concessions eventually passed on, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, Unilever, to Feronia in 2009. After Feronia filed for bankruptcy in 2020, the banks passed the assets they held in, in the plantations to Kurama Capital Management, the investment management firm that owns the majority stake in the PHC plantations and the major foundations, university endowments and pension funds who are involved in the plantations through the investments in the KCM, Kuramo Capital Management. Now KCM first invested in the plantations in 2017 at a time when the wrongdoings of the company and many issues faced by the communities were widely documented. Since it acquired the majority ownership, KCM has continued to ignore community demands to negotiate. Instead, it has been pressuring the community leaders to sign agreements with the company that undermine the mediation process, that undermine the demands of the communities. So let's just take a second to look at who these investors are. I should also mention that it is almost impossible to find the investments, as you might very well know, they're not made public knowledge. So at the Institute, we have had to really dig into KCM to find who are the agencies that are supporting uh, their investment in the plantations. Perhaps it will be surprising or not so surprising for some of you. Some of the key investors are University of Michigan Endowment, which is the largest known investor in the KCM. It lacks a guiding ethical investment policy, so investment decisions are driven by expected financial returns. The next is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the second largest known investor. You have the Government Employees uh, Pension Fund, South Africa's largest pension fund. You have Washington University in St. Louis, Kamehameha Schools in Hawaii, Northwestern University, General Electric Pension Trust, J. Paul Getty Foundation, and there might be many others. I don't know if any of you are interested in it. Point is, this is happening not in something that is in 2011, 2007, or 100 years ago. The colonial takeover of resources in the name of financial returns with the euphemisms of doing good in the, on the African continent, for instance, is something that's used. And in all of our investigations, when we have reached out to the investors, it's pretty stunning that none of them have done diligence they can tell us the financial returns that have been promised to them. There has made no diligence on the so-called impact investment that they believe they're engaged in. But worse is when communities have reached out, when the wrongdoings have been made obvious that they have failed to take action. Uh, in this case, uh, none of the agencies that I mentioned that we have reached out to in terms of the wrongdoings and the continued abuses on the ground, none of them have responded so far but the students have started organizing to mention why you should care. The students have started organizing at the universities. And lastly, I would just emphasize, this is not just about reputational risk and it is not just about um, what is the right thing to do. It is what Nicola pointed out and so did Susan and Michael, which is obligations of non-state actors. This is human rights and not just the responsibility of governments and so, the violations that take place, the actors who are invested in the DRC PHC plantations are accountable for those human rights abuses. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And let's see, there we go. Now for the, the second part of, of this panel, we're going to look at what investors can do to mitigate human rights violations in their own investment portfolios. And what I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to do is to just highlight one or two steps that investors can and should take, and then we'll move to, to Q&A. And so the order will be Nikolai, Susan, Anurada, and then I'll go at the very end. So I will turn it over to Nikolai. Thank you very much, Michael. So, yeah, I, I wanna to touch on a, a few things in relation to due diligence, also just uh, to um, respond to, you know, uh, one good example, which we just heard about the extent to which uh, investors currently fail in their due diligence process because they simply don't understand their exposure. So that is obviously the primary step 
for any investor on human rights is, is to understand what is the risk exposure, uh, what are the, the sectors they're exposed to, what are the key risks there, certain geographical issues they should be aware of, uh, and what is the severity of those risks. Uh, and they should understand all of this in order to manage those risks in the first instance. So that is just the baseline for, for any investor due diligence in human rights. And of course, it's important in this process that the investor relies on good information that would come directly from the company and expectations need to be clear, but they cannot rely solely, solely on that information. There are obviously a huge dependency on commercial uh, data providers that might be a useful input. Uh, there are benchmarks by uh, civil society organizations uh, on a variety of issues and sectors that might be helpful to draw on. Uh, and generally just reports on um, issues such as uh, Amnesty's great work on, on VC, but um, Amnesty does work on, uh, on, on human rights issues specifically, so does other civil society organizations. That's a great uh, source of input. And then of course the stakeholder engagement. The investors are often far removed from the actual impacts on the ground, but they can, and we know that the leading investors do take steps to make sure that they understand uh, the perspectives of people on the ground that might be affected by uh, companies that they hold. And that's just the fundamental baseline uh, for any uh, action that the investor can take. Um, and just the last important point is, of course, that a lot of the uh, asset owners, so uh, pension funds and the like, they might be exposed to these human rights risks, but it happens through uh, outsourcing of uh, fund management. So it is, of course, important in this whole value chain that those asset owners require their fund managers to do the exact same thing on due diligence and to report back to them. And the asset owner is ultimately responsible for quality checking that process and that information and to draw the right conclusions in terms of future mandates. Um, on the basis of that information. Thank you, Susan. Yes, so for venture capital, it's the same thing that Nicola just mentioned, just ensuring that you're selecting fund managers that do have a minimum an ESG policy and a due diligence process, and then explicitly in including language in the term sheets to those investors on um, respecting human rights. Um, for VC funds, um, sort of have the bulk of, you know, doing this due diligence because they're the ones in closest contact and sitting on the boards of these companies. Uh, there's sort of three steps to this. The first is um, conducting uh, human rights due diligence as part of the um, overall due diligence process for the fund, which isn't happening, as Michael mentioned, almost anywhere at this point. Uh, but basically what that looks like is, you know, instead of us just going in there and looking at what's the market size, what's the growth rate for this, who are the competitors, we also will uh, try to understand sort of what, what some of the human rights risks might be like, what's a potential abuse case of this product, who don't we want this using, what would be an unacceptable use of resale of the data of this company, um, you know, if someone was going to sabotage this company or launch a cyber attack against it, you know, what, what would the motivation be or how would you mitigate that? So we spend a, a little bit of time in that due diligence process asking these kinds of questions which is very fairly new for venture capital. They're not really accustomed to thinking this way. It's very sort of upside and positive. Um, and then uh, because they, a lot of them will take board seats, uh, they can include a term sheet clause, which I believe uh, Michael talked about the firm Atomico in London. They have this uh, where they're asked, I think within six months to produce an ESG action plan. Uh, so identifying what their most material risks are, what the risks are to the stakeholders, and then you know a mitigation and a remediation plan in case uh, that there are adverse impacts to those particular stakeholders. So including that in the term sheet to make sure, and then as a board member, actively staying engaged and making sure that management is identifying and actively taking steps towards the implementation of that plan. So those are sort of the three steps, uh, anticipate, mitigate, and then remediate. Great, thank you. Honorata? Thank you. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah, there's several things. One is, um, you know, in the course of our work, we have just found a lack of um, just diligence not happening. You know, you have these investment conferences happening, investment in agriculture in Africa and elsewhere in, in New York, in Geneva. None of them tend to have a session, which is looking at how to be accountable. So that is one of the biggest issues. Uh, it is left to the goodwill of who might be interested, 
But one thing that I might want to point out is I started with the colonial times because I think the biggest thing that has to happen is to shift that power imbalance, that white colonial mindset, which still sees investment in places across the globe where you take over the lands of communities, whether for agricultural investment or you know, timberland investment. I mean, I have to say every time I say investment, it kind of bothers me because it's really a theft and comes with the euphemism of investment. Um, I think it requires questioning. Uh, you know, a lot of the fund managers that we have talked to, you know, they don't even question to look at the land rights. You know, if you and I tried to invest say, in Boston, we know the number of pages of contracts around land leases and deeds we would look at. But the fact that people are investing, funds are investing, university endowments are investing without looking at the land rights and happy to kind of just move ahead looking at financial returns is pretty stunning. So that whole colonial mindset that the rest of the globe is available for our investment to enrich looking at the returns is problematic. Um, the, I mean, the other big issue I would say, especially for institutions such as university endowments or for pension funds is they should be held accountable to let uh, the students, to let other parties know what they're really investing in. Because that creates certain kind of accountability where investigation or research can happen. Without that information being available, it is very hard to find out which portfolios, you know, what is included in the different portfolios. Terrific. Thank you guys very much. And I really have very little to add to, to what everyone has said, just to let you know that building on, um, in particular, something that Susan mentioned, we are doing research now, looking specifically at university endowments and seeing to what extent, if any university endowments are requesting that VC firms who manage some of their, their assets are themselves conducting human rights due diligence or whether university endowment funds are simply investing in VC firms without doing even that most basic level of, of diligence. We have about 15 minutes left. And so I think now would be a great time to, to move to the questions. And I've been tracking the questions that people have been um, adding to the chat. So I will go through those. If anyone has additional questions, please feel free to, to just throw them in the chat and we'll um, address those as well. So the first was the lack of diversity amongst VC, I mean, sorry, a lack of diversity amongst ESG champions, um, which is something that I'm both emblematic of and also struggle with. Um, I was wondering if any of the panelists have, have thoughts on that and what can be done to, to sort of make sure that those of us who are talking about these issues actually more closely resemble and represent the communities on whose behalf we presume to speak. Michael, I'm happy to say a word on it. Um, I think uh, across different fields, we see these inequities. Uh, the shift to understanding that the, so if you are doing investment for, for ending poverty, we have to understand that the best experts on poverty are the poor. So uh, that was a colonial mindset that I was talking about at the Institute. We specifically work with the communities rather than even with professional NGOs to get to what the communities need and ask for. And so for instance, the research that we pointed out in DRC, it is not being done sitting in Oakland. This is working with local researchers, working with the communities to elevate their voices. One of the questions was, uh, you know, in terms of, do you work with the different funds to help them do the right thing? What we really encourage is for funds, for instance, to connect directly with the communities. If your intent is not just financial returns, but really boost development, you have to be connected to the communities whose well-being, whose development you're talking about. So I think it is that kind of shift that is needed, that is required. I think the private equity, as your research shows, is a huge problem, as long as it is dominated by you know, uh, by right with the uh, funding going to venture funds, which are controlled by, again, a certain race, that is going to be problematic. And how do we shift that? 
Yeah, if I, if I can just add, Michael, this is something that's uh, very much of a concern to the PRI as well on two fronts, really. So, you know, we recognize the issue in the investment industry very broadly. It, it definitely extends beyond private equity and whether you're in, in London or New York or, or, or Melbourne, uh, these risks, uh, these problems are the same. So uh, we have a work program underway and a paper due uh, later uh, this year, I believe. Uh, which is the sort of kickoff point for us to work more specifically on the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's, of course, not only about diversity to the extent that uh, that different groups are represented in, uh, inside investment institutions, but also whether they are actually properly included and are facing similar opportunities and uh, as, as counterparts. So that's the one side of it. The, the other thing is that we've actually also internally uh, undertaken an exercise um, uh, to review our own practices um, because I think we have as much of an issue as most uh, financial institutions. Um, and that's something we have actually an employee group uh, that's been working with management on these issues. Uh, so it's just to say that, yeah, we, we do look inside our own house as well. We're not just uh, <laughs> uncritically uh, advising the investment industry without um, our own sort of assessment for ourselves as well. Terrific, Susan, anything you wanna add or should I jump to the next one? Um, another question is whether any of the panelists are directly engaged with the SEC in terms of the issuance of new ESG guidelines or the House Financial Services Committee looking at this. I know that we are not. Um, I'll pass it to the others. We have provided feedback and testified, but not directly involved. Yeah, Michael, um, uh, we've been working with our team in the US, our policy team in the US, uh, and responded to the public consultation, uh, I believe, a few months back. It was a, a strong focus on climate change, um, and perhaps rightfully so. It's, uh, of course, the most urgent issue of our time, but we did still give it the input that we felt the SEC should also be looking uh, beyond those factors. Um, and of course, we've seen so much movement in Europe over the last couple of, couple of years with uh, close um, collaboration between the investment industry and policymakers and civil society. So at the PRI, we draw a lot on, on, on some of the learnings there. And so we, we obviously rec we, we recommend that the disclosure framework does represent the broad scope of ESG issues and that human rights is a it's a core part of that. So I do believe there's a, there's a further work on human capital. Uh, I think that's the term the SEC uses. So that's something we'll be monitoring as well. And do any of the panelists, do any of you serve as advisors directly to funds? And if so, I'm curious your experiences, what kind of arguments you see as being most effective at reaching those within these institutions? What resonates? Susan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, I do consult uh, to a couple of different venture capital funds. Um, mostly my, my role has been sort of helping uh, them develop an ESG due diligence process and then getting ESG issues in front of their investment committees. Um, so really just starting the journey. This is still a very new area. So unlike you know, public markets where there's fully mature um, ESG functions inside the investors in the companies is still brand new. So um, what are, what are the interesting observations maybe relevant to this group is that they have expressed a lot of frustration that in their fundraising processes, none of the LPs care about ESG. They've tried to go forward and present like, you know, we have a responsible approach, here's how we do this, but you know, they don't even know what to do with that information. Um, partly because I think Going back to your research, Michael, like a lot of them don't, a lot of these large institutional investors don't even have an ESG policy. Um, and particularly among the ones who do, including a couple of pretty major ones that have significant ESG policies and practices in place for their public market, they have pretty much told us that they don't consider this for venture capital, only fund returns matter. And part of the reason why is that in the venture capital industry, it is so disproportionate in terms of who has the largest fund returns uh, that it's really that top sort of quartile of funds that are driving all the returns in the industry. So they've sort of gotten a blank pass at this point to do whatever they want. And a lot of those funds just are not interested in ESG. We've done some engagement with them. That's starting to change um, just because I think outside pressure is coming from groups like Michael's. It's coming from some of their the companies they want to invest in run by millennials and Gen Z's that you know, want to 
you know, want to be with a, re a more responsible investor. So it's starting to change, but it's like this is really being driven by sort of emerging fund managers who don't have that long track record of, you know, achieving high fund returns. So I think that's sort of where I think the, the challenge has been moving the industry forward. So I think the LPs really do need to step up, um, and start asking for this as part of the, you know, the investment process into selecting their, their uh, fund managers. Oh, Michael, if I may add, uh, to maintain our independence, we do not consult with any uh, of the funds. Of course, if they want to talk to us and learn from our you know, research, we are glad to share that and we have done that. Um, I will again emphasize perhaps not the most popular thing to say, but I think we have to look at the capitalist nature of this colonial mindset, which is focused on extractive industry, including agriculture, which is extractive when you think of large scale agriculture and to invest in it. What Susan just said that most of the people don't even want to talk to fund ma managers, the fund managers that I spoke to say at Vanderbilt, they were like, you know, we really didn't do any diligence around social impact. We are focused on a return. So it's a complete, you know, upside down backward system. So you can't just fix the system when it is already completely broken. One clear thing that I would advocate for, I think if the university endowments included, we should really be focused on supporting and nurturing student-led university, uh, you know, responsible and uh, endowments coalitions. I think that is really responsible. Uh, the success that we saw at Harvard or Vanderbilt was not because the fund managers had a change of heart because they suddenly learned about the egregious human rights abuses. No, they don't give a damn. It happened because the students mobilized. It was a time of occupation, where, uh, occupied movement where they linked the struggles from uh, Africa to right there in their own communities. You know, the 99 person versus one person. So I think we have to look at solutions which are about supporting and boosting the grassroots, the students who will hold these endowments, um, you know, people who have the pension funds invested from TIA to other places to hold them accountable. Um, and this is what the struggle is about. Um, even if you look at divestment around fossil fuel, it's not because suddenly everyone is like, oh, climate change is happening. It's like a train wreck that we all know we are headed into and yet we are on it. It is again pressure. It is unfortunate. It is sad that you know, we have to deal with that instead of rising and doing the right thing. But, uh, but I think we would be fooling ourselves that if we just talk to the fund managers at Harvard or somewhere, the change would come about. Uh, we have to talk about dismantling capitalist, white, racist, colonial mindset, which is focused on growth, which is only explained in numbers. Nicola, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I think a lot of the issues uh, that are set out, um, they're very true. I mean, the point Susan made about um, you know, the issue with the top quartile private equity managers, uh, basically they can pick and choose. Uh, so one of the traditional ways of influence that the PRI has is that the clients, the asset owners are you know, able to push through their ESG requirements, but that's, that's extremely hard in the private equity space. Um, I, I also just wanna make a point that I think a lot of the, you know, a big part of the institutional investment the capital is basically our capital as savers in the system, as pensioners, right? So if you think at it from that starting point, you know, a lot of pension funds, these investors, they have a sort of social purpose that is that is good in the first place due to a, a range of factors, low interest rates, so forward, they're seeking returns elsewhere. And so they're venturing into private equity. And here we've seen, we've discussed some of the issues today. I think a lot of the issue is in the disconnect here uh, between you know, the capital and the interest of those people that it's supposed to serve in the first place, and then the consequence of it. Think about another asset class like real estate. It is quite ironic, I think, that uh, we as pensioners will save money for retirement. And um, that is one of the important financial decisions we'll be making. Another one is to buy potentially property if we're lucky enough to have the capital for that. But that is a sound financial decision often to make uh, when you can. But 
our invested capital from our pension side might contribute to the types of real, inv- real estate investments uh, that uh, hikes the prices of properties, both rent uh, and ownership. So there are there are just the way I see it, some inconsistencies here, and the rent extraction that um, Anurada uh, refers to is a big problem, and I think it's a problem also with the regulation. Um, a lot, a lot of times, fund managers are doing what they're they're hired to do, their mandate is, and what the regulatory context uh, actually instructs them to do. Um, so, so that is where a lot of the issues sit uh, as well. We we need to remember that the regulatory context in a lot of cases drives these decisions in the in the funds, and there's a huge risk of litigation uh, if pension funds or fund managers. Uh, are not seeking the highest returns. I agree it's a problem, but there are there is just a legal and regulatory context here, which is problematic, and that we need to tackle that as well. Terrific. Well, guys, we are at time. And so I just want to say a tremendous thank you to, to our panelists and to Kaede and the entire Intentional Endowments Network for, for this opportunity and for this really stimulating conversation. Um, Kaede, I understand that the, the slides are available to, to share. Is that correct? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself, but yes, that is correct. And we will follow up with the slides um, as well as the recording of this webinar um, afterwards. Terrific. Well, guys, you have an extra two minutes. Uh, again, a tremendous thank you to to everyone and very much looking forward to continuing the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And I also want to extend my thanks to uh, the panelists, Anuranda, Nikolai, Susan, and Michael for just sharing your perspective with us and being here with us today. Um, and I also want to thank you all for your active participation in the chat as well. Um, and again, please reach out to us if you're interested in engaging with us further on this topic or have thoughts on the you know, approaches or perspectives that we weren't able to get to today that you would like us to follow up on um, in the later series. We also wanted to let everyone know that our final milestone of our climate action pursuit will be in December, where we'll have sessions like this, as well as sessions to celebrate the progress that members have made this year and look ahead to 2022 to share what's upcoming for the network. So we hope that you can join us for the Climate Action Pursuit. And again, thank you so much for your participation and have a great rest of your day. (laughs) Thank you.